Thank you all again for coming. We're so excited here at Buffalo State University to partner with Pursuit of Truth and the Whitfield Brothers. And right now we have a special guest that I'm excited to introduce and bring to the stage. Dr. Jelani Cobb is a historian and Dean of Columbia's Journalism School, a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2015. And he's a recipient of the Sidney Hillman Award for Opinion and Analysis, as well as fellowships from the Ford Foundation and the, Fulbr and the Fulbright Foundation. He currently lives in New York City and we are honored to have him here at Buffalo State University. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Jelani Cobb. Good afternoon. How are you all? Good, good. Um, so I want to thank you uh, for the invitation to be here with you all today. Um, I know this is a somber occasion, and that there are uh, difficult sentiments and difficult recollections uh, to be explored in this uh, occasion difficult conversations to be had, uh, but I also think that in, in moments of difficulty, it's possible for a community to express their resilience. And it's possible for people to say that what was meant for evil, people can turn into something good. I want to thank uh, Garnell Whitfield, who reached out to me. Mm -hmm. who reached out to me uh, and invited me. And as soon as I found out uh, what was going on, I said, you know, I'll be there. Uh, if I have to move something else or cancel something else, I'll make sure that I'm available. Um, which you don't know, I have family uh, in Buffalo. I, you know, one portion of my family from Alabama came up and went to New York City. And another portion of my family, cousins, came up uh, to Buffalo. And so when I knew I was going to be here, I reached out to uh, one of my cousins and when I told her why, uh, she said, oh, the Whitfields must have brought you. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, how'd you know? And she was like, oh, I know the, the work that they're doing. And I was like, do you know them? And she said, no, I don't know them. They don't know me. Um, but I said that to illustrate uh, that even you know, people who you don't know uh, have seen the example of what you're doing and the way that you are uh, transforming uh, this terrible moment into a statement that will ultimately allow us to hasten the day in which we place white supremacy in its grave. So I want to talk a little bit about the context of these events and my perspective on them. And because I'm a historian and because I'm a journalist, uh, some of this is about current events, and some of this is about history. And so we're going to talk uh, about the interconnection between the two and how they inform this moment and how we can move forward from here. <clears throat> In June of 2015, I was uh, at home and working on a story, and usually I would minimize my Twitter feed when I was at work. It was late at night, uh, but I had my Twitter feed open on the side of the screen, and I see this scroll is going crazy. And I was like, okay, something has happened. I need to take a look. I need to see what this is. And everyone has a hashtag that says Charleston. And I look at this, and I get the basic details, and I drop the story that I was working on and started pulling together all the information that I could find about what was happening in Charleston, and also started making preparations because I knew that morning I was going to get a phone call that would send me to Charleston, South Carolina. And so I get the phone call, and I fly to Charleston, and I begin investigating what has happened on the ground there. <laughs> and as we know, there was a murder spree in the Emmanuel AME Church, in which nine congregants were killed in the midst of their prayer by a white supremacist bent upon sparking a race war. This is his objective. He 
shoots one person, a young man by the name of Taiwanza Sanders. And Mr. Sanders responds in a remarkable fashion, tells him, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. We mean you no harm. And then he asks, why are you doing this? The murderer says, I'm doing this because you all are raping our women and taking over the world. He then fatally shot Mr. Sanders. We know about this conversation because this conversation was witnessed by Tawanza Sanders' mother, who could not go to her son's aid because she was covering her granddaughter, her 12-year-old granddaughter's body, hoping to hide her, which she successfully did, hide her from the view of the murderer. And so she said at the trial, two years later, I watched my son take his first breath in this world, and I watched my son take his last breath in this world. 24 hours before that shooting spree in the church, a reality television star took a ride down a gold-colored elevator in Manhattan and declared himself a candidate for the presidency of the United States. This was a little known, a little discussed uh, event, save for one set of comments that elicited a response in the media. He remarked that the country was besieged by Mexican rapists and that this was a rationale for him running for the presidency. And so we had that language of men of color posing a violent sexual threat to white women deployed twice in 24 hours, wildly different contexts, but responding to the same primitive white supremacist fear. And the implications of those two moments have been mutually reinforcing in the years that have followed. And they are deeply implicated in the tragedy that this community witnessed on May 14th of last year. So let's take that moment and move backward a little bit. The church, Emmanuel AME, is in Charleston, South Carolina, the site of the initial shots of the American Civil War. The shooting happened in 2015, which was the 150th anniversary of the end of that war. And South Carolina had a particular stake, a particular investment in this conflict, a particular quirk in their history, which is that it was the only one of the 13 colonies in which the majority of the population was black. So from its outset, there's this great deal of fear and paranoia that was baked into the history of South Carolina, later Mississippi, which had the same demographic uh, dynamic. This deep-seated fear about what would become of them if black people ever rose up in their midst. And it generated one of the most rigorous forms of adherence to white supremacy. I mean, in America, it's hard to distinguish yourself for racism. There's so much of it that, you know, in school when people would say, when teachers would say, uh, you have to apply yourself. You know, you could do good if you apply yourself. You have to really apply yourself to stand out for racism. But South Carolina did it. And what comes out of that is, I had a conversation, this is a, an aside, 
I had a conversation once where I was reporting. I was reporting in the aftermath of the shooting, and I interviewed this man who was the president of the South Carolina Secessionist Party, which was a neo-Confederate uh, organization. And he was adamant about defending the Confederacy, saying that the Confederacy was not about racism and so on. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, the majority of South Carolinians didn't support the Civil War because they hated, didn't support the Confederacy because they hated black people. And I said, the majority of South Carolinians were black. They didn't support the Confederacy at all. <laughs> and you could see like, <laughs> it's like the black people were South Carolinians. I was like, shocker, they were human too. So, this is the backdrop here. And in the aftermath of that war, W.E.B. Du Bois writes about it in the book Black Reconstruction in a chapter called The Propaganda of History. He says we would never have an honest conversation about what caused the Civil War or what happened in the aftermath of the Civil War. And that was for two reasons. He said, because the South could not look posterity and the rest of the world in the eye and admit that it had fought to their last man for the right to buy, sell, rape, traffic, abuse, and exploit black human beings. When you look at the landscape of devastation and decimation that covers the South, the white South, in the aftermath of that war. And the question that successive future generations would ask, why? You can't answer that question honestly. And so they begin to retreat into a fictional mythological abstraction, saying that the war had been fought over this vague constitutional principle of states' rights. And so that acts as a shield for them to cloak the moral horror of their truest motivations. But what about the North? Surely they have a reason to say what this was all about. And Dr. Du Bois wrote, well, the South couldn't admit what it had actually done, and the North could never admit that it owed the survival of its democracy to black men who had been property. That it was slaves who saved. Your founders had a hypothetical idea of democracy. But the continuance of the, of the pursuit of democracy, the extent to which this nation could call itself a democracy, was a product of those 200,000 black men who left the cotton fields and joined the Union Army. And that was a kind of debt that they never felt comfortable talking about. And so there was a gentleman's agreement that they would never talk about what happened in the war, about why the war had been fought. And what that meant was that the underlying conflict could fester and reassert itself which it did with stunning velocity across the South in the aftermath of Reconstruction. In the forms of white supremacy, the volatile forms of white supremacy that arose had one intention, which was to reduce black people back to the condition as close to slavery, if not actual slavery, then a condition as close to slavery as possible. In 1915, 100 years before the shooting in South Carolina. A filmmaker by the name of D.W. Griffith releases a film called Birth of a Nation. It is the first epic in American, the history of American cinema. It is hailed by cinephiles and scholars of film for the many technical innovations that Griffith brought about. 
It is also a love letter to the Ku Klux Klan and the role that the Klan played in the aftermath of Reconstruction, of lynching, murdering black people out of political contention throughout the South. And that film is denounced. People talk about it as racist for what it said about history. Uh, that was the least offensive part of it. What was most offensive and most dangerous about that film was not what it said about 1865 in 1915. It's what it said about 1965, what it said about 2015. It's not what he was saying, what Griffith was saying about the past. It was he, what he was predicting about the future. And so in that film, the reason that it's called Birth of a Nation is that Griffith proposed a deal, a compromise, 50 years after the end of the Civil War. The film essentially says that the lingering animosities between the white South and the white North could be cemented, that those bonds could be reaffirmed through their mutual, mutual hatred of the Negro. At the, at the end of the day, he said, we are all white people and we are united by a common cause even if we are separated by geography. And that is a fairly accurate description of what happens in the ensuing years of the 20th century. As we begin what's called the Great Migration, in which millions of African Americans leave the South, the Deep South, and arrive in industrial centers in the North, in the Midwest, and in the West, the people from Mississippi who go to Chicago, the people from Louisiana and Texas who go to Los Angeles and Oakland and San Francisco, the people from Georgia and Virginia uh, who go to uh, Philadelphia and New York, the people from uh, Georgia, Virginia, Alabama who come to Buffalo and create these new communities. And in short order, we begin to see the rise of conflict, of violent violence that mimics the type that D.W. Griffith had glorified in 1915. And so here we saw representatives, and we were in the green room, we saw representatives of the Urban League and representatives of the NAACP. And both of those organizations arose in response to the violence that black people were being subjected to, not in the South, but in the North. The NAACP comes about because of the rise, because of a lynching that happens in Springfield, Illinois. The National Urban League is established because of black people who are being systematically locked out of economic <laughs> opportunities in the North. And this is the path, the checkered path, that white supremacy walks as it moves to forestall the possibility of opportunity wherever black people may be in this country. And for a time, this appears to be a fairly successful strategy. We have a civil rights movement transforms the landscape at nearly with, with no feasible options for continuing the old state of affairs after the Second World War. This country grudgingly and reluctantly embraces a broader form of democracy. In 1965, we see the groundbreaking landmark legislation, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, overnight transforms the landscape. The number of black people who can vote, the number of black people who can participate, the number of black people who can be elected to political office. And over the course of years, as black people begin to develop the ability to elect congressional representatives, 
mayors, in some instances, senators, members of state legislatures, there's a slow ratcheting up of the possibilities. Until 2008, we see the election of the first black president. It's something that none of us anticipated seeing in our lifetimes. When people talk to me about this and say that they were excited in 2008, I always, I'm a historian, I always correct the record. I say in 2008, there were exactly four people in the United States who thought that we were prepared to elect a black president, and they all lived at the same address on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> but this happens. And in the midst of that jubilation, a friend of mine calls me, he works in politics, and he says, it looks like he's going to win. And I said, it does. And he said, you do know that there's going to be hell to pay for this. And I said, there will. And what we began to see was the resurrection of the same sort of dynamics, the same sorts of fears of black people's political power and enfranchisement that had driven the first response after emancipation to lynch black people out of political contention. And so in 2015, as I'm going back and forth to cover the trial of Dylan Roof. I'm walking, I stayed in a hotel that was about eight blocks from the courthouse. And I walked back and forth every day, walked past the building. And at some point, I'm only looking at the ground floor of this building. At some point I look up and realize that I'm walking past the Charleston Confederate Museum. So I look up and I see the displays and I say, don't mind if I do. And so I walk in one afternoon and I'd forgotten to take my press badge off. And there are two women there. One is in her 40s roughly and one is in maybe in her 60s. And they could not have been nicer when I come in, welcome, South Carolina Confederate Museum, what brings you here? And then she sees my press badge and says, well, you're press, why are you here? And I said, I'm here to cover the trial of Dylan Roof. And she says, oh, her whole demeanor changes. She says, we don't need a trial. And I was like, what do you mean? She said, just get rid of him. And I said, well, it's funny that you should say that because right now the jury is deliberating about whether or not to give him the death penalty. And she said, we don't need to deliberate. Just get rid of him. And so I ask what is to me the perfectly logical question. What do you make of the fact that Dylan Roof did what he did as a tribute to the same cause that is being memorialized by this museum? <laughs> And so that question went over exactly the way you would expect. <laughs> First off, I'm the only black person in the museum. And everybody stopped. I'm old enough to remember, some of y'all will remember the old E.F. Hutton question, the old E.F. F. Hutton commercials. And it was about a stockbroker, and it was like, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and he says, and as soon as he gets to that, everything goes quiet. They want to hear what he's saying. That was what happened when I raised that question. Everybody stopped. And the woman says to me, oh no, the Confederacy wasn't about racism. People didn't understand you know, what the Confederacy was about. I, what, what, why, why do you think that, that this person flew the Confederate flag? He just didn't understand. Well then, why do you think white supremacist organizations around the world fly the Confederate flag? Oh, they don't, they, they just probably saw something on the internet. They don't understand the Confederacy was not about racism. And in that moment, it occurred to me 
that the person responsible for those actions was a murderer and a monster, but he wasn't a liar. That he had been the only one willing to say boldly and proudly that he was devoted to the cause of white supremacy and that the state had been conceived in dedication to the cause of white supremacy. And that he had committed this act of horror, which responded, which created the copycat acts that have echoed down to this day as a tribute to that cause of white supremacy. And because the history that Dr. Du Bois talked about had been so completely obscured, over time, there were people who considered themselves adherents to the cause of the Confederacy who could not even tell you with an honest expression what the Confederacy was all about. And the murderer considered himself a prophet to change that state of affairs. So when we look around the landscape now, it is no coincidence that we have suffered from this tide of violence. It is no coincidence that there are 10 people in this community who needlessly died. That there are 11 people who died in a synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018. That there are 23 people who died in the Walmart in El Paso, Texas, in 2019. It is no, mo no coincidence that in this moment, we see community after community grieving, reeling in response to this kind of horrific violence. And we are simultaneously moving to remove the truth of this nation's history from our schools. What Dr. Du Bois understood in 1935 was that the violent attacks on white supremacy didn't happen in a vacuum, that they were anchored and justified. They were preceded by the violent attacks on history, that it was an attempt to create a state of affairs a perception of the world that would lead to the outcomes that we have seen in community after community after community around this country. And so this is where we are. This is how we found ourselves at this moment. It is also not coincidental that just as in the period after the end of Reconstruction, the violent assault on communities of color has coincided with the attempt to remove our abilities to vote. That these things are connected. As we see barrier after barrier being erected to make it more difficult, more complicated for people to cast a ballot. And I remember looking at this as we saw the immediate aftermath of the 2016 election, Charlottesville. And as mentioned earlier of the chant, uh, people uh, in the Tiki Torch Brigade saying, you know, Jews will not replace us. And ultimately, you will not replace us. And I was saying to people, you know, I am in a lot of activist communities, and I cover a lot of stories. And I've covered the spectrum of these kinds of places. I've never had anybody pull me aside and say, shh, don't tell anybody. We're gonna replace all the white people. <laughs> That's not it. The opposite has happened, though. When we talk about the great replacement theory, 
and the fear that white people will be outnumbered, the same kind of fear that people had in South Carolina, the same kind of fear that people had in Mississippi, what happens if these people outnumber us? But the opposite is the case. At the point of contact in the 16th century, Native Americans were 100% of the population of North America. They are now less than 1% of the population of North America. In New Church, the indigenous population there in New Zealand, 100% of the population, the point of European contact, 2% of the population now. Or Hawaii, where the indigenous Hawaiian population is about 3% of the population. So people have been replaced, but it has been white people doing the white, the, the great replacement theory has replaced the indigenous people with the white colonies, colonizing populations. But if you invert history, you can make it appear that the victims are the vic that the victimizers are the victims and the victims are the victimizers. And so the violence that we see here is predictable. We say that there is no sense to the violence we see, but there is a terrible logic, a logic that has replayed itself throughout our history. So what do we do from here? And how do we proceed? I believe that the battle over our future begins in the past. That first we have to diligently and with great determination and resolve refuse the attempts to redecorate history such as to make it more appealing to individuals who never believed in our humanity in the first place. I've seen some of the stuff that's happened in Florida. I mean, if you kind of watch this and you have a particular perspective on it, I heard the governor of Florida say, um, you know, his problem, he had a problem with people who said that, uh, you know, they say things like, uh, America's built on stolen land. But, well, did we buy it? <laughs> Was there some big real estate deal that we didn't know about? They have this attack that they're making on the history of Florida, on the history of the United States. It's like, well, you can't teach the history of the United States. You can't even teach the history of Florida without honestly confronting the white supremacist legacy of how that state has its origins. In 1819, when that upstart general, Andrew Jackson, marched into what was then a Spanish possession, and set up camp at the place that's now called Jacksonville. He did it at the behest of Georgia landowner, landowners who were worried about the indigenous people going back and forth over the border between what was Spanish territory and what was American territory, and of them refusing to respect the boundary between these two nations. It's like, well, they had been there for 20,000 years before you got there in the first place, so they get to determine what the boundaries are. That's the first thing. The second part of it is that he did so at the behest of Georgia slaveholders who were attempting to prevent black people from having an escape route into the South. See, we know about black people escaping from slavery and traveling north prior to 1820. If you were a person who was enslaved in Georgia or South Carolina, you tried to flee further south, recognizing that neither the Spanish or likely the uh, indigenous populations of northern Florida would return you to bondage. And Andrew Jackson invades Florida in order to prevent that from happening. So the very origins of that state are indebted to white supremacy. He says we can't talk about the, the land being stolen. So you can't, what do you, 3,000 
indigenous people from Florida after Andrew Jackson becomes president and signs the Indian removal. Like you all took 3,000 indigenous people out of your state. We're not talking about the rest of the, the, the states in the union. And so what we see there is a pernicious attempt to lay the groundwork for the continued reign of terror in our communities. And so we have to resist that. Secondly, we have to adamantly and recalcitrantly defend democracy where it exists and pursue it where it does not. What that means is that we have to, in the courts, in the streets, in the classrooms, resist the attempt to mitigate our ability to vote. And this is the second tier of our approach here. And thirdly, we have to take a lesson from the pages of history on our own terms. And that is, these struggles are long, and that we lose battles along the way. But in the scale of everything that we have endured, the battles in front of us are smaller than the battles behind us. That we move with a particular historical momentum. That we, nothing we attained and nothing we achieved has come in the short haul. But if we are dedicated enough, devoted enough, if we are mindful enough, if we are willing to endure, it's possible for us to win. And it's only through that kind of commitment, it's only through that kind of recognition that we can make sure that none of our ancestors will have died in vain. And in particular, in this community, we do this to pay honor to Mrs. Ruth E. Whitfield, to Pearl Young, to Catherine Massey, to Hayward Patterson, to Celestine Cheney, to Aaron Salter, to Geraldine Talley, to Andre McNeil, to Margus Morrison, to Roberta Drury, to that great long lineage of people whose lives were lost in the course of our pursuit of freedom and democracy. We have not yet won, but in their names, in their honor, in their memory, we will. Thank you.